So welcome everybody to our first, uh, our fourth train the trainer session that will be about operation and optimization of renewable district heating systems today. My name is Heidrun Kögler. I work for the Energy Agency of Styria and together with the IE INTEC, we are organizing the train the trainer sessions, which are one part of the work package T2, knowledge transfer and belong to the activity capacity building within the end trend project. All in all, uh, five train the trainer sessions uh, have to be held until October 2021. And uh, the one today is the fourth training session and I will lead you through the program of today. In the meanwhile, uh, we got already used to holding and participating um, online sessions. Uh, but uh, just for the sake of completeness, just a few words uh, to the technical details in the beginning. So, so this uh, session uh, will be recorded and might be released afterwards. Of course, only if we, got, if we get the okay from all our speakers. <coughs> uh, please, uh, mute your microphones and switch off your cameras during the event. <clears throat> and if uh, any questions come up during the presentation, please note them, don't forget them, and ask them in the discussion rounds after the presentations or in the end of the training session. For a short overview about the previous inputs, I just want to recall what we already learned in the last training sessions <clears throat> and in some additional sessions. Our first training in November 2019 was about how to develop a project from the scratch. So it was about the first steps for planning and initiating renewable district heating systems and their key factors for success. Um, and a very important content of this training was also the pre-feasibility study that should be done before a, a project is started. The second training was in June 2020 and was about fundings, economics and financing of renewable district heating systems. <clears throat> it's very important for the investors and also potential operators of district heating systems uh, if their plant is profitable. Um, so we learned some details about economic profit profitability calculations, <clears throat> how to compare heating costs of district heating systems and individual heating systems. We heard about some examples of economic feasibility of solar thermal projects and also of the Bioenergiedörfer from Germany the funding models in entrant regions and also about contracting as a possible financing and operation model. This training was also supplemented by one presentation at our online web, web meeting in September, where we saw a short presentation from Christoph Walder from NG about how to convince potential investors of district heating systems. Then uh, the last training was the third training, uh, which was held in December 2020. <laughs> and this was about uh, tasks that are very important for each operator of combustion plants. Because uh, burning fuels, and especially if it's biomass, produces many different emissions, <laughs> as for example, fine dust, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, oxygen, oxides and also ashes. So these are byproducts <clears throat> and these emissions must be re reduced as good as possible. Um, how we can do that and which uh, legal framework in the different countries regulates that were the content of our last training session. And as an add-on of our last web meeting in the, in the last April, we invited Christian Holter, who took us to a virtual study tour to the solar thermal and biomass district heating plant in Mürzzuschlag. And here are the contents for our training of today. 
even if we are still sad uh, that it's not possible to meet in person this time again, we are very happy about the possibility to involve external experts in a very easy way. Thank you all that you are here. Um, I will just give a short overview about the program. After my introduction, our first speaker will be, will be Klaus Gall from Gall and Gärtner. He will give us a short introduction to the operation of biomass district heating plants. After that, we will learn something about the technical aspects of optimization, modernization of district heating systems, which are presented by Josef Biandala from the Energy Agency of Upper Syria. Then we will have a 10 minute coffee break and start at 10.30 with the presentation of Klaus Bahr from Güssing Energy Technologies Comp Company. He will focus on, the on, on some practical examples for op optimization measures. <clears throat> and at 11.15, Christoph Aste um, from Aste Energy will continue with kind of a virtual study tour to do flagship projects where the integration of alternative renewable energy sources were increasing in the, ener uh, the energy efficiency of district heating systems. And finally, after a further five minute coffee break, <clears throat> um, we thought it is good to make another short break um, because it, otherwise it would be too long, the last part. Uh, Christian Ramersdorfer from the IINTEC will talk about monitoring, which will be a first early input to the training on the adapted QM Heizwerke. <clears throat> And finally, after a further discussion and feedback round, we will come to an end at 1 p.m. So now I want to introduce uh, Mr. Klaus Gall from Gall and Gärtner <coughs> as our first speaker. He was co-founder of the Wood Heat Cooperative Weiler Wärme EG and as an architect, he already planned nine heating stations, <coughs> most of them for heat cooperatives. So he gained a lot of experience in the operation of district heating systems and he will give us a short overview of what the key issues and challenges in the daily operation of a district heating system is. <clears throat> also which safety related issues are important <clears throat> and what has to be considered concerning the qualification of operating staff. Klaus Geil, um, you can begin now, it's your stage. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I first try to um, let you see my PowerPoint. Yes, we can see. Can you it. see? Yes. Okay. So I start the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, please allow me just to introduce myself uh, and my background. You noticed it already in, in some uh, words already. Our office is now uh, 80, 86 years old. Um, my partner, Theo Gartner, he is a civil engineer and we are working together on, on many uh, biogas and biomass um, heating projects uh, locally and nationally. My partner, uh, Theo Gartner, he is planning the heating networks and he is planning also fiber optic and um, power networks, um, which is going along with the heating ne networks. Um, my, I, for myself, I'm a structural architect. I, I was already planning uh, many uh, heating plants, mostly for local energy cooperatives and also for municipal institutions. Twelve years ago, I was founder of um, um, and, and also for 12 years a board member of our own energy cooperative. Uh, we are a small village in the Black Forest and uh, we are supplying almost 75% of our town with local heating already. This is our uh, energy cooperative called Weiler Valme EG. 
we have all, all, almost 1,000 members. We were successively uh, extend exp our local heating network. We we were uh, building year by year. We have now uh, 37 kilometers of local heating pipeline and approximately 60, 665 connected buildings. And um, with the extension of our heating network, we also had to expand our heat supply. And we have now set up more than 15 heating system for year-round supply. We have built up a cascade structure of the local heating supply. Um, the base load supply is uh, in regenerative combined heat and power production. We have two ORC, organic ranking cycle power plants fired with wood chips and we have one biogas plant with a total output of more than six megawatt. And this uh, base load is more than 80% uh, supplying of the whole uh, heat for the year. Then we have a medium load supply with renewable fuels with wood chips, heated by wood chips with also um, for more than four megawatt. For the very cold winter season, we use this, but as you can see, it's only 8% of the annual heat supply. And then uh, we we have to have always a failure reserve with, and we, we build up this with fossil fuels with more than uh, 5.7 megawatt output but as you can see this is also only used in very cold winter season and when we have a failure of one of our power plants so today we are talking about operation of biomass district heating plants uh, with these three titles challenges in daily operation safety related issues and complete uh, qualification of operating operating stuff so from my experience as a um, as a board member and also as an architect who, who is um, in discussion with many uh, energy cooperatives when we plan and build up this um, this uh, heat uh, houses I found out that um, the challenges in the daily operation, uh, they are for, for the fuel purchasing, for the fuel storage. These are the problems you have to care every day of the fuel supply, that there's always um, enough uh, fuel or wood chips on board the maintenance and operation and the ash disposal. Plus, um, you have the mon to monitor the heating network. You have to do adjustment and troubleshooting for heat consumers. And you have a emergency operation and 24 seven standby. So who can who can um, manage these challenges. So very often I found out that um, the, the themes of fuel purchasing, the fuel supply, maintenance and, and ash disposal is done by external service. What have to be done by internal administration is monitoring the heating network. You have to be a partner for your consumers for people who uh, who ring you by night and uh, complain that there is uh, no heat, and also the emergency operations has to be done by locals. Also, we have safety-related issues. 
uh, this starts already when, when while doing the construction work. <clears throat> but this is the re responsibility for the architect or for the contractor. Um, we have in Germany, we have many building laws. Uh, we have occupational health and safety laws and uh, therefore the the manager or the 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 people who who um, organize the energy cooperative they have not very much to do with these themes but also there are safety related issues uh, in heat production like noise, dust, heat and risk of fire in the boiler house or fall from great heights. Therefore, the operator always, I, I can just uh, tell you how we manage this in Germany. Uh, the operator have to make an individual risk analy analysis and has to do uh, employee training. And for the external operators, operators you can transfer this responsibility also and um, for the internet internal administration uh, of course you have a computer system and have to set up a emergency management and an emergency operation with extra heating system as a failure system as a failure reserve. So why I talk about this is because there is still no job title called operator of biomass district heating plants. So the question is who can do this? Who is qualified for all this? Um, for all these claims. Um, the maintenance, maintenance of the heating system and the heating network can, for example, be done by a plumber, by a heating engineer with the practical experience, or even by a construction company for civil engineering. This is my experience that mostly uh, this is done by, by heating engineers or by plumbers. And the administration, <clears throat> this is uh, very different, but often I experience that is a combined management. Ideal is a combined management trio consisting of a planner and, uh, or administrator, a banking specialist or a craftsman. So you can do all this computer network. Uh, we can you can do the administration and the consulting of um, the clients. So this is in a few words my experience, and if you have questions, I listen. <laughs> Thank you. Much, okay. For this short and clear introduction about uh, the main challenges of the daily operation of district heating systems, um, I just realized that we started a bit early. <laughs> so <laughs> now we have half an hour for questions. <laughs> no. Okay. So just please ask if you have any questions. Maybe, uh, Mr. Garil, you can you can uh, go more into detail in some some tasks mm -hmm. that you talked about. Mm -hmm. mm. My yeah. I'm sorry. This is hard speaking. Um, uh, I have one question or remark uh, regarding plumbers. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, maintenance can be done by plumbers uh, for district heating systems uh, and the heating plants. Uh, I suggest to take care here uh, what exactly we mean with plumber. Uh, um, according to Austrian German standards, plumbers are, are companies um, responsible for installing heating systems in single family homes, multi family homes, larger buildings, everything like this. Uh, our experience with plumbers in biomass district heating systems uh, and general district heating system is not the best. Uh, so plumbers are usually not experts in this field, so they are not experts in constructing uh, and engineering of plants. So there are, there are larger companies which are used to install uh, industrial plants, district heating systems, and they are uh, uh, from my point of view, the correct companies to 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 build and maintain uh, district heating system and and biomass district heating plants. For smaller plants, okay, we can talk about plumbers, but we clearly see uh, a difference in quality and engineering um, with, with many of these things. So, from my point of view, we should take care here. Uh, ordering a plumber uh, into a large biomass district heating plant. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it depends on the on the size of the district heating um, of the local system. Um, yeah. I actually have one client, um, and we built a, a, a biomass um, a, a quite big uh, um, heating plant for him. Uh, this he he organizes one plumber. He organizes. I mean, for a small village, it's uh, 300, 300 houses. He he um, he heats by his by his heating system, and he, of course, he has to get uh, a lot of experience year by year, and he's building up the system year by year, and he is very interested in renewable energies, so. Um, um, he is able to manage a heating system, but maybe not not everyone. You cannot uh, generally say every plumber is also a manager of a heating system and heating network. That's yeah, right. it's, not, it's not about managing, it's about the skills of plumbers. Uh, plumbers are not used to, to weld biomass district heating pipes, usually. I mean, larger companies uh, and small projects, yes, but 300 uh, uh, heat consumers is not a small project for me. So I, I just I, I don't want to talk negative about plumbers, but just the, just the care, what experience and what skills they have, because usually they do not have uh, experience in, in in building district heating systems, uh, uh, and especially you mentioned our sea plants uh, and thermal oil uh, systems. Uh, there, a plumber is not the correct person or not the correct company. Uh, I, I have experienced that 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 the plumber wanted to weld a, a thermal oil system. And they didn't even know that there are different pipe materials available, and that they uh, that they are going to build a system which has more than 350 degrees. So we should take care here. That's that's the only thing I would want, wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. But of course, it it depends on the company, uh, and it depends on on the size of the plant. I mean, um, he his. Um, uh, he's m may be able to manage, but uh, of course he's not uh, not able to build up a system. Therefore, he needs an architect and an engineer. That's that's right. But but um, uh, for firing the the heating system and to to manage the network, um, if he, if he has enough experience, yeah, it it. it it depends on the plumber, but what is your suggestion? Who would you uh, suggest uh, who is the best manager for a heating system? What can you uh, say from Austria? Well, um, it, it depends. I was talking about maintenance and constructing building of systems. Uh, managing systems, um, there it is exactly as you said, there is no, um, there is no, specialized job description there is no special education for district heating operators uh, or or biomass district heating operators there is a lot of uh, things education certificates for large urban district heating systems 
like operators in Vienna, Graz, wherever. Of course, they have their own systems, they have their own standards, which usually are not applied with the small plants. Uh, and small biomass plastic cleaning plants need, need different skills uh, and education. In Austria, um, the Biomass Association has started uh, uh, an educational course for plastic cleaning, biomass plastic cleaning operators. Um, but as you said, this is a critical point because the, the success of a plant strongly depends on the skills of, of the managers and the operating personnel. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think there is no uh, ideal person, you know, or let's say a plumber is the ideal person or a farmer is the ideal person. We have everything in Austria. We have more than 2,000 plants and we have whatever you can expect uh, within these plants uh, as a manager. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this input, Harald. Are there other questions? Johanna? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Gall, you mentioned your fuel supply as one big area of challenges. Could you maybe say a little bit more about that? How is your fuel supply organized? Um, where do you buy your fuel? Maybe how is that contract? Um, how do you secure um, prices that are feasible for you? And how can you make sure that you buy regional wood? Um, we are strongly observed by by the people in the in the village. Um, they they want to be served by local wood chips, and um, our operator who who manage the the heat uh, the 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 power plant. He has actually, I think, 15 or maybe even 20 different contracts with suppliers, uh, and and that's uh, that's quite good because if one supplier cannot supply, he can get uh, the wood chips from another. And uh, I said already, we 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 are located in in the middle of the Black Forest, so in the middle of the wood and uh, therefore we have no problems in the last 12 or 13 years we have had never problems to get enough wood chips from one of our local supporters who who work in the woods uh, therefore this is not a problem uh, getting enough wood chips um, he even uh, the price fell the last two years since we had very dry summers and there was enough wood who had to be made in the woods uh, it's even more a problem for the for the storage of the many uh, wood chips he needs all year or all winter long and of course it can it can be uh, stored in uh, outside but uh, it's always better when there is a at least a, a roof over it and and therefore he has to manage as you can see in the picture it's quite a big mountain of, of wood chips and uh, it's still not under the roof but he extra built a new uh, a new storage hall uh, last year uh, so that he has enough dry material thank you okay <laughs> Very important that the that the wood chips are dry for heating. Uh, it depends on the heating system. So um, when you order the the firing system, they exactly um, uh, build it for for your purposes, and uh, they ask you what kind of of uh, burning material you you have for the supply, and. Um, mm -hmm. They they are constructed constructed that uh, even uh, more um, humid material can be burned. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, uh, the, of the course. energy the uh, the the it, it you get out more much more energy of the dry material. But this of is course. always a, a calculating um, a, a question: how many how many wood chips uh, do you extra uh, um, store and and dry uh, 
which also um, makes cost and makes it a, a little more expensive and yeah. therefore you get a, get a bit more energy so this is always a calculation for the operator yeah what, if you have I, to try the wood chips it's it's often a, a big uh, effort and that it's an effort and you need energy, energy. But of course, it's good uh, if the wood chips are under a roof. <laughs> That's true. Right. That's yeah. true. Yeah, uh, great. In, in fact, uh, I had a discussion with one uh, operator, uh, with one uh, energy cooperative. They have an extra uh, external supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, the contract with this supplier is that they do not pay him by, by tons or by, by cubic meters. Uh, they, they pay, they have a contract uh, paying him by, by the energy they get out of his material. So this, this is, is a good idea, yeah. Yes, so this <laughs> is in the responsibility of the supplier, uh, what kind of material he supplies. Mm -hmm. Yeah good idea to solve this problem. Mm. So are there any other questions? If not... Um, with maybe something regarding fuel, fuel purchase. Um, QM Heizweg can make it very clear. Um, sorry, I, my, my camera is off, so you can't even see me. Um, so um, QM Heizweg can make it very clear. Um, the fuel quality has to uh, fit to the furnace system, uh, as Mr. Gahl said. So that's very important. This means uh, you have a furnace and you have to be aware of what kind of fuels, uh, starting from the water content, but, but many other uh, quality criteria of the fuel as well, fit to your furnace. Uh, this means if you buy fuel, you have to check the quality. So you have to be sure that you get the quality you ordered and you paid and that this quality fits to your furnace. Uh, in Austria, we see that, that many operators start to optimize the fuel costs by buying cheap fuels. Cheap fuels usually has lower fuel quality, more moisture content, whatever. Uh, and these then do not fit to the furnace. So um, this does not necessarily mean that you really uh, optimize your system in an economic way. Maybe in short term that you have lower fuel costs, but take care of maintenance costs, they keep in, take care of slacking, take care of a lot of problems uh, in operating the furnace. Yeah, so, because <clears throat> this also makes additional costs. Yes. In the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this, this is an issue you, you should, some, sometimes cheap fuel cost is, is just uh, a short term view. But in the end, it's more expensive uh, than, than having good fuel quality. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you, Harald. <clears throat> Are there any other questions or inputs? If not, we will. Um, I think um, I saw already saw Josef Biantara. So thank you, Mr. Gall. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Josef Piantara, are you already here? Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. I just want to problem so, with the camera. Yeah, but okay, I... Okay, now it is can see you. Hello. So Josef Piantara is our next speaker. Thank you to be here, Josef. <laughs> Josef Piantara uh, is CEO of the Energy Agency of Upper Styria and also teaches at the Ad Advanced College uh, in the Fachhochschule Joanneum. And he is a QM manager according to the QM Heizwerke in Austria. <clears throat> He will give us an overview about the theoretical part of uh, the technical aspects of optimization and modernization of district heating networks. 
Uh, he will talk about the basics of energy optimization, the improvement of the energy performance, as well as the importance of load and heat storage management and network densification. Josef? Okay, your... thank you. But uh, I have one problem at the wrong screen. Uh, yeah, no. no problem. Maybe you can uh, switch it off again and start. How uh, can you switch off the screen? Um, I don't know exactly. <laughs> Maybe, uh, can you, Yara, okay. can you, uh, yes, make the moderator role? Uh, ah, now it should yeah, work. It's still work. Yes, uh, it's the moderator. We can see your presentation. Yes, yes, but, uh, you see the. Uh, we can see it now, Josef. Yes, uh, but uh, if I share the screen, uh, if I go into the presentation mode. You can I'm switch the screen then for the presentation mode. Go go to the presentation mode again, please. Yes. Uh, I understand. Um. <laughs> Uh, the problem is <laughs> okay. just that, yeah, yes, in here. Okay, and, and now? then you can uh, uh, okay. switch with Anzeigen Einstellungen, I think. Anzeigen Einstellungen, yeah. Ganz the oben. Second point on the top, uh, yeah, genau, in the middle, oben das. Uh, okay. Genau, and da kann man jetzt wechseln, den ersten. Genau. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, to... okay. So sorry for the problem. Uh, I'm used to uh, teach online a lot, but I use uh, MS Teams and uh, Zoom. <laughs> I was not used to this. So sorry for that. Yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Joseph Berntaler, and I want to. Uh, explain you something about technical aspects in of optimization and modernization of district heating uh, systems. Uh, just some words to our energy agency. Uh, so I'm working for the energy agency for more than uh, 20 years, mainly in the field of renewable uh, energy sources. And in this kind, uh, quite a lot of uh, in the field of biomass. I'm uh, working uh, in the quality management uh, of uh, biomass district heating systems. And from this uh, work, I know uh, more than 100 projects. Uh, so I'm uh, really familiar with this topic. But uh, we are also working in the uh, field of energy efficiency, uh, especially in the building sector and production facilities. And uh, one part of the work is also uh, European projects, R&D projects, uh, uh, where we are involved uh, in this field. And uh, for uh, in the consultancy work for renewables, for the building sector and energy efficiency, always financing and funding is, is also a part of this. And we do also training courses. And as Harald mentioned, there's also a training course uh, for biomass installers from the Austrian Biomass Association. And some months ago, I did also trainings uh, for uh, these people. So if we talk about uh, optimization of the energy efficiency of uh, biomass district heatings, uh, we should talk about uh, general uh, basics of optimization, uh, improvement of the energy performance. Uh, one part is the network densification, and I would also talk about something about heat storage uh, management. So, but starting with some uh, basics, but I'm sure you are familiar uh, with biomass district heatings. Uh, we have uh, the 
the central house uh, with the heating system. Uh, this means uh, the fuel uh, deposit, it can be inside or it can be outside. We have a lot of uh, uh, places where we store also the uh, fuel outside. Uh, we have the uh, biomass uh, boiler, biomass furnace. We have uh, cleaning uh, for uh, the flue gas and the chimney system and then the grid system to the customers. But i show you this on the next slide. Uh, because uh, for optimization, uh, we should separate uh, the system into three parts. And one of the main part is the customer side. I uh, want to start with the customer side because if we talk about uh, optimization, uh, the customer side is uh, one of the most important uh, which affects a lot of other things in the uh, heating system, the district heating system. So the customer side uh, consists of the secondary side. Uh, this means uh, the heat distribution uh, inside of the house on the customer side. And we have also a heat transfer station uh, with a heat exchanger uh, just uh, to separate uh, the water from the heating grid inside of the customer system uh, from the uh, water in the district heating uh, system. Then we have the heat distribution system. Uh, this means the heat grid uh, and the, the grid pump uh, for the operation of the heat grid. And then we have the heat supply uh, with the furnace, with the firing chamber, with the heat exchanger. Uh, in a lot of cases, we have also uh, heat storage systems and all of the uh, regulation for temperature for load management uh, and so on. Okay, uh, just uh, a general overview about efficiency uh, optimization. So uh, on the next slide, I want to explain you something about the customer side because this has the main influence of the uh, to the system temperatures and afterwards uh, we have to discuss uh, heat losses of the district heating grid uh, this means uh, the system temperatures uh, in the foreflow or the supply uh, line and the backflow or return uh, flow uh, pipe we have to discuss also the heat density this means how many megawatt hours uh, can you sell on one meter of a district heating grid? So this is a very important uh, figure. Uh, I want to discuss some types uh, and insulation standards of pipes. Uh, and uh, for efficiency, it's also important uh, if we have a full year operation of the district heating grid or only in winter time. But I think in Austria, uh, most of the uh, grid systems they are in operation uh, for the full year because the customer uh, wants the services to get also the hot water preparation in summertime. And in the last part, I want to talk about uh, heat production and fuel efficiency. Uh, so we will discuss uh, dimensioning of boiler. Uh, there's also high influence uh, in the setting of the firing systems. This means the excess air, the flue gas temperature, uh, the CO2, which is in the flue gas uh, at the end. Also uh, cleaning uh, of the flue gas ducts, uh, the heat exchanger, uh, this has an influence uh, to the efficiency of the heat exchanger and uh, also the quality of uh, fuel and the water content. Uh, I will show you some figures at the end. And uh, we, we, in the discussion, uh, we discussed about the water content uh, of the fuel. Uh, we can also discuss heat recovery systems uh, in the flue gas flow and also uh, buffer storage management. So in my opinion, these are the main aspects uh, which we should discuss uh, if we discuss about efficiency. 
So one slide uh, to the customer side and the secondary side, because this influences really the supply flow uh, and the return flow temperature. This means uh, we have to know uh, the type of customer, uh, which kind of customer do we have, uh, which load characteristics do they have, and it makes a difference if this is a, a dwelling or uh, yeah, just room heating for buildings, or if it is uh, industry uh, companies with process heat. Uh, the type of the heating system, uh, this has a main influence uh, to the supply flow temperature. Uh, it depends if you have radiators uh, where we need higher uh, temperature uh, in the floor flow in the supply line, uh, ground floor heating systems, uh, we can have uh, lower temperatures. Uh, one recommendation is to use uh, large heating surfaces uh, this means uh, if you have large heating surfaces, uh, you can get, uh, uh, you can uh, use uh, lower uh, supply flow temperatures. And one effect is also to get a lower uh, return flow temperature. One uh, problem in a lot of cases is the efficiency of hot water preparation. Uh, so if we connect an existing building, uh, the hot the type of hot water preparation uh, is uh, very important. So we have to use high efficient hot water preparation. I'll show you the next slide, uh, an example. Uh, hydraulic ba balancing is important uh, for uh, an efficient system on the customer side. And you should also use high efficiency pumps on the customer side. Uh, the return temperature limitation in the transfer station, uh, this is also one part. Uh, just uh, limit the uh, backflow temperature uh, to the district heating uh, grid. And uh, it uh, looks easy from the technical side, uh, but in a real case, uh, this is a, a, this is sometimes difficult because you have to raise the awareness at the customer side. You have to discuss uh, with the customer why it is important uh, to get low uh, return flow temperatures. In some new cases, uh, there is also a bonus tariff for low uh, return flow temperature in the delivery contact, contract uh, for the customer. Different types of uh, hot water preparation. Uh, if you install a new system, then it's uh, recommended to use high efficiency uh, registers uh, with uh, large surfaces uh, in the heat exchanger for the hot water preparation. And uh, the other possibility is to use uh, freshwater modules, uh, which are uh, used uh, very often now because uh, you have no stored water. So you prepare the water uh, very fresh uh, with these systems and the good hydraulic uh, balancing. Uh, it's possible to get uh, low return flow temperatures. Uh, problems are with older systems where the heat exchanger is very small, so it needs a long time. You need a high amount of uh, water flow in some cases, so uh, this affects the return flow uh, temperature. Some technical aspect, how uh, can we measure uh, the heat consumption? Uh, I'm sure you know the formula. Uh, the amount of heat is uh, the product of the specific mass flow. Uh, this means the water uh, which is delivered uh, to the customer, uh, the specific heat capacity, and the temperature difference between the uh, supply line and the return line. And I want to show you this formula uh, because uh, you see very easily that the return line uh, temperature uh, is very important 
for uh, an efficient system because if the return line temperature is higher, uh, so the difference would be smaller and you need a higher mass flow. So this is one reason uh, why hydraulic balancing on the secondary side is uh, very important uh, to get uh, high uh, temperature differences and low mass flows because this affects uh, the, also the electricity for the grid pump and uh, the temperature affects also the losses of the uh, heat grid. Uh, I don't want to discuss uh, the details between heat exchangers and hydraulic balancing, uh, just uh, one uh, figure maybe. Uh, this should be the optimum uh, case. Uh, you have the primary side from the district heating grid uh, with your temperatures and you have the secondary side. The red line is from the district heating grid and the blue line is from the customer side. And the goal of hydraulic balancing is uh, to uh, provide uh, a high temperature on the customer side if they need it. So a small uh, temperature difference on this side. And on the other hand side, uh, the goal is on the red line, you get a very low uh, backflow temperature. And uh, in these two slides, you see the, the lot of uh, failures in, in a real case uh, where you could not reach the uh, the temperature uh, on the customer side or where you have high temperatures on the uh, on the return uh, flow uh, to the district heating. So uh, there is a wide range of uh, optimization in this field. So what is the product from the customer side? Uh, you have to sum up all of the customers. Uh, depending on the size, dep depending on the uh, amount of heat they need and the, the mass flow. And the result will be that you have a uh, needed uh, for flow or supply line uh, temperature. Uh, in Austria, in main cases, it's between 80 and 100 uh, degrees Celsius. In some cases, in the large cities like Vienna or uh, Graz, it's, it's more than uh, 100 degrees, but in the smaller one, it's between 80 and 95, 100 degrees. And the quality of the customer side uh, gives you uh, the back uh, line temperature. Uh, this is in Austria between 40, which is uh, very good. We have a lot of systems which are between 50 and, and 60 degree Celsius, uh, depending on uh, the quality of the customer side. So uh, this is one uh, aspect. Let's talk about uh, district heating grid and uh, pipes, uh, because uh, the material you use, the thermal insulation standard you use, uh, this is uh, one important uh, fact for uh, minimization of grid losses. I'm sure you know the, the standard solution uh, which we use since uh, decades. Uh, this is a steel pipe uh, with a, a foam insulation, pre-insulated pipes, and outside we have uh, polyethylene uh, material uh, just to protect the pipe uh, from water. And in this case, you, you see how it is taken uh, the underground. Uh, not much common uh, in some projects uh, is uh, the type of a twin pipe, uh, but uh, this has a significant uh, advantage because if you have the supply line and the back line in one pipe, uh, you have a better insulation and uh, the heat losses of such a pipe, uh, they are uh, smaller uh, compared to two single pipes. So uh, this is one uh, possibility to drop down uh, the grid losses. And the other possibility is uh, to use higher standards, 
because uh, in a lot of cases uh, in uh, the manufacturers uh, they give you the possibility to choose between different uh, insulation standards for pipes uh, the difference is uh, the thickness of the uh, thermal insulation. Uh, in this case, you see also another uh, solution for small projects like micronets. Uh, this is a, a flexible uh, pipe uh, made of polyethylene, but this is only for, you know, for smaller pipes for temperatures up to maximum 90 degrees. And there are also uh, some interconnections uh, from uh, twin pipe systems to single pipe systems. So you can also combine this uh, in enlargement of uh, grid systems, uh, for example, for dropping down the grid losses. Another uh, aspect uh, regarding uh, grid losses is the grid typology and structure of grid systems. Uh, just to show you a typical uh, example, uh, uh, this is a rural village, uh, like with a, a lot of systems in Austria with a biomass district heating. Uh, normally, uh, you start with the large uh, objects, the large customers where you can sell uh, quite a lot of heat. And uh, then you so where are my customers, uh, what is the heat demand of the customer, what is the load demand of the customer, and uh, then you try to, to build a, a grid uh, system uh, from the beginning. But uh, if you start at the beginning, uh, it's also good to think about how to enlarge the system, where are the next customers, and how can I reach the next customers. Uh, this is another example. Uh, with a uh, grid structure where I see that there are quite a lot of uh, buildings uh, connected uh, to the grid systems. Uh, why, is it, why is it important uh, to get a lot of houses? If you have very long uh, grid lines and uh, very few customers, uh, it, so you dig a lot of uh, money into the underground for the grid system and you sell just a few amount of, of heat. So this is one aspect uh, why uh, it is important to get a very good heat allocation. Uh, heat allocation, this means, heat allocation means uh, the sold heat at the customer side divided by the grid lengths. If we go back to such a, a picture, if we have long lines with just a few customers, uh, then uh, you lose a lot of uh, potential for selling heat. So for grid densification in existing projects, uh, it's uh, very good uh, to analyze uh, how many customers uh, do I have uh, very close to the grid line and can I convince them to connect uh, to the grid systems. And on the other hand side, if you go to a, a new area for enlargement of the grid systems, uh, then it is uh, really good uh, to do a good analysis uh, about the future customers. Uh, how many buildings, uh, what is the energy uh, consumption of the buildings? So in this cases, it's wise to ask them for their energy bills, so for the amount of energy from the uh, last three years, for example, uh, to get a, a good overview. And uh, then it's good uh, in such a quota uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get a lot of contracts uh, before you start building a grid system. So this heat allocation, uh, this is one important uh, performance indicator there's a recommendation from Kulm Heizberg here, it should be uh, larger than 1.2 megawatt per uh, meters of grid length. Uh, we have uh, systems uh, which are going down uh, significantly, but uh, in these cases, uh, you need uh, very good conditions for building 
uh, of such a system, uh, you need uh, very good insulated uh, pipes and uh, the, the underground uh, for the construction of the grid system uh, should be easy, not many roads. So uh, it's important to get uh, a cheap system for the grid system. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, you would never be economic. This is one aspect. Uh, so it has an influence uh, to the economy. And uh, the other aspect is uh, you get higher grid losses if you have lower figures on this side. On the other hand side, we have uh, good projects uh, which are significantly above this. So this means large customers with, with high energy demand and uh, low uh, uh, short grid lengths. The heat losses, uh, uh, what's the definition of the heat losses? Uh, this means uh, the heat losses in the grid in megawatt hours uh, divided by the heat fitted into the uh, grid systems. How did you get these figures? Uh, you need uh, a heat meter, uh, the, uh, at the heat production side, where you start with a grid system from the from the heating system uh, to the grid, so you have a heat meter there, and you know also the uh, heat consumption of your customer and the difference between the fitted in uh, heat and the heat uh, which was uh, used by the customer. The difference is the uh, heat loss in the grid system. So there is also one recommendation: it should be lower than 15% uh, for new projects. Uh, and in existing projects, we have figures between five and uh, 25%. In some cases, this is much more higher. And uh, we also saw in optimization projects uh, that it is possible to drop down. Uh, the heat losses also in existing systems. Uh, but this means uh, you have uh, to have a good discussion for optimization with your uh, customers, especially uh, the large customers which have, which have high uh, backflow temperatures, dropping down the backflow temperature uh, and uh, good balancing of the hydraulic systems. So this is one uh, aspect also where it is possible to uh, get higher efficiency and lower heat losses in existing projects. Another figure uh, is the electric consumption of the uh, grid pumps. This means the electricity of the heat pumps divided by the sold heat. And there we have a, a figure of about uh, 15 uh, kilowatt hours uh, per megawatt hour. So this is approximately a target uh, value. The mean temperature between supply and return line, I talked about this. And the specific volume flow, uh, this is in direct relation with the electricity uh, consumption of the heat system, uh, of the grid system. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, no, on the, okay. It comes a little bit later. Uh, and we have also uh, full load hours, uh, full load hours. Uh, is also a key performance indicator on the customer side uh, as well as for the heat production. Full load hours by definition is the uh, used heat divided by the uh, nominal load of the customer. And we have some key figures for residential buildings uh, where it is about 1,600 to 1,800 in hotels uh, with high energy demand, uh, wellness, baths or hospital, it's, it's higher in schools which are just in operation maybe in the morning, uh, then it, it can be a little bit lower. But this depends on the building and this depends also on the climate uh, data at the 
location. But this is uh, useful for uh, the calculation of uh, the heat load. If you have the heating uh, demand from the last three years from an existing uh, building, uh, you can uh, analyze the optimization potential uh, if you want to have this as a new customer. And with such full hours, you can uh, get an estimation about the nominal load. Uh, I think I focus more on the technical indicators, uh, but the economic indicators, uh, they are also uh, quite important for new installation or for enlargement of grid systems. This means the costs of the grid uh, divided by the uh, grid lengths. And there is really a huge variation uh, in the costs depending on the green field uh, or if you have roads or if you are inside of uh, cities where it is uh, where it is hard uh, to where it is hard to uh, to dig the the pipes and also the cost uh, of heat distribution uh, this means uh, the cost of the grid system divided by the sold heat per megawatt hours and there, is all, there are also uh, figures uh, and uh, maybe I don't know if Harald is saying something for this because the, from QM Heizwerk there is a very good benchmarking uh, system uh, of a lot of projects in Austria uh, where where we know the, the values uh, is the minimum, uh, the mean and the maximum values. Uh, these are uh, out of this benchmarking uh, system. Coming back to the electricity consumption of uh, grid pumps. Uh, this is a, a typical uh, duration uh, curve. This means, uh, sorry, this in, in German. Uh, this is the uh, electricity of the grid pump uh, and uh, these are the, the hours of operation over a year. And in such a duration curve, uh, you see it corresponds directly uh, to the uh, outside temperature. Uh, this means on the coldest days of a year, customer needs a lot of heat and also the mass flow uh, is high at this time. So we need a lot of electricity for uh, the grid pump at this time. Uh, and the duration curves say if the outside temperature is higher, uh, if the heat consumption of the customer is lower, also the uh, consumption of the electricity is lower. But there are two uh, strategies uh, for uh, the regulation and control of the uh, grid pump, uh, we can use uh, fixed differential uh, pressure uh, in a grid system, which we have in older systems. Uh, then we need uh, higher uh, electricity demand. And if we switch to variable differential pressure uh, for the grid pumps, then we can save nearly 80% of the electricity. And the grid pumps in, in a lot of systems, this is the main uh, consumer, uh, or the one of the main consumers uh, with, uh, of the electricity, uh, which is also a figure in the economic uh, balances. Uh, so we have to drop down uh, the electricity demand uh, significantly, and this is one uh, solution to use this. And just one slide for your awareness. Uh, the temperature difference on the customer side uh, or the temperature system of the grid system between the foreflow and the backflow and the specific volume flow uh, is a curve uh, like this. And as you can see easily, if you have temperature differences, uh, Below 30, uh, there uh, is a significant rise in the specific volume flow. And a rise in the significant volume flow means also a rise in 
the electricity consumption of the grid pumps, just to demonstrate why it is uh, important to talk about this. So just uh, some uh, recommendation uh, to the grid densification to the grid system. Uh, one goal is the improvement of uh, the heat allocation in megawatt hours per meters of uh, grid length. I explained already, try to get large uh, customers uh, along the grid line and all customers which are very close to the grid line uh, they should be convinced uh, to connect uh, to the grid system uh, just to get higher heat allocation. And for the estimation of the heating demand, uh, in some cases, uh, in the discussion before, I had something about qualification of our planners, uh, qualification of operators and so on. Uh, it is very important to raise the awareness for a very good estimation of the heat demand of buildings because we know uh, from older projects uh, that the heat demand in some cases uh, is too optimistic. So uh, they calculated a higher demand uh, because they wanted to be sure uh, that the customer has a warm house but uh, it's a problem for the operator uh, because uh, if uh, everybody uh, calculates a, a sure plus on the heating system and the heating demand of buildings, the result will be that we have uh, two large heating systems uh, with low efficiency and uh, yeah, two large figures and we, we, we spend too much money for uh, the heat demand of the customer. So uh, we have to get uh, very clear in this point and uh, do good estimations. For new buildings, we can use the energy certificates. Every building needs an energy certificate uh, by the building law. And for existing buildings, I explained, uh, we, we have to capture the heat consumption over the uh, last three years, so this uh, should be asked uh, from the customer. And you should also do uh, analysis of the secondary system. This means uh, optimization potential in the hot water preparation, uh, especially the hot water demand in, in hospitals and hotels uh, should be known and also process heat. heat. And uh, you should ask your customers, your potential customers also uh, if they plan uh, thermal insulation during the next years because uh, if we look at the political uh, goals, uh, if we have a significant rise in uh, thermal insulation, uh, it has also an influence uh, to the heat delivery of biomass district heatings. Yeah, and we should analyze the potential of the customers. Okay, uh, and uh, now coming back to the uh, heating system. Uh, this is a typical picture of a biomass uh, great uh, furnace. I have to look for the time. I think I have a little bit of time. Uh, Joseph, so, you have you have enough time. <laughs> no okay. <stress. laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this is a typical uh, type of uh, uh, biomass grade furnace. Uh, this means uh, you have a, a firing box with a, a heat exchanger uh, on the top, and we have a flue gas chain uh, to the chimney. Point one. Uh, we have the fuel input. It can be a hydraulic uh, system for larger uh, furnaces. And in other cases, there are uh, screw types for smaller systems. Uh, we have uh, 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 the firing place uh, on the grate. Uh, so uh, we, in the first step, uh, the biomass is dried by the heat of the system. 
uh, then it starts uh, to uh, get out the uh, to get out uh, the gases from the biomass, and at the end, on a longer way, uh, it's moving uh, to the right direction. Uh, you have the charcoal, and in the last part, the charcoal uh, is oxidized in the firing box. And for the regulation of such a system, you have the primary air systems, which comes through the grate and through the, uh, the biomass material. And then you have also a secondary uh, combustion air, uh, just to get a uh, full and uh, very good oxidation of the biomass and, and the material, uh, which is in the gas stream. You know, biomass uh, has one specific, uh, you have a very long flame and you need very good turbulences uh, to mix uh, the uh, gases from the combustion uh, and burn out uh, these uh, gases uh, very efficient and uh, in a very good quality just uh, to minimize the emissions uh, at the end of the system. And just uh, at the end, uh, you go with the hot flue gases uh, through the heat exchanger and uh, change the heat uh, to the uh, water system, mainly it's a water system uh, for district heatings, but you can also use uh, steam systems for biomass CHP or organic oil or, uh, for the organic uh, ranking cycle uh, for higher temperature. But for the efficiency, it's uh, important to have a very good regulation of the, the air system and the parameters for that uh, you get uh, from the flue gas chain. Uh, this means uh, you have to measure the uh, CO2 uh, at uh, the end. Uh, the CO2 uh, content should be as low as possible, uh, five, six uh, percent. Uh, just uh, to have not too much air which you uh, use uh, in uh, through your boiler. And also the other emission should be low, uh, NOx. Uh, this is mainly depending on the fire room temperature. And uh, also CO2, you should have no C, uh, uh, CO, sorry. Uh, you should have no CO. Uh, this is uh, if you have CO, it's uh, not uh, fully combustion. So these figures you get out of this. And you have, of course, the temperature, the flue gas temperature, uh, depending on the, the load uh, of the boiler and depending on the, uh, on the heat exchanger. Uh, if you have a lot of dust uh, in the heat exchanger, maybe it can have an influence to the temperature in the flue gas chain. Uh, water content and calorific uh, value of wood. Uh, in the discussion before, uh, we said we have to use uh, dry uh, material. Uh, what is the influence of the water content? Uh, if you have uh, fresh uh, biomass uh, from the forest, it has an average between uh, 50 to 60 percent uh, water content, and uh, uh, and the uh, uh, lower calorific value is quite uh, low uh, in this case. And if we store the wood uh, one two years. Uh, then it dries up uh, in a natural way and you can uh, approximately double uh, the heat content which you can use in, uh, from, uh, in the boiler from, from the biomass. Uh, just a comparison to pellets. Pellets uh, has a water content lower than uh, 10% and in this case you have uh, the highest uh, calorific uh, value. Uh, if, if we buy the biomass, we have to be aware that there are two uh, possible uh, calculations for the water or the, or the moisture content. 
Uh, one uh, is on the wet basis and one is on the dry basis. Be careful on this. Uh, if you do comparisons, what is the difference? Uh, the moisture content uh, on a wet basis means the mass of water divided by the mass of wet wood. So how, it, uh, how is it done in a real case? Uh, you take a sample of the wood chips, uh, if you get the, the wood delivered, uh, you put this into, uh, you, you take the mass, so of these wood chips, uh, then you dry the wood chips in a, in a dryer, and uh, then you uh, take the mass a second time, and the difference is the, the water content. So uh, it's easy to, co to calculate uh, this on the wet basis, basis, but you can also calculate this on the dry basis. The difference is uh, you divide the mass of the water divided by the dry wood. So in the first case, uh, it's uh, divided by the mass of the wet uh, wood and the second time divided by the uh, dry wood. This is important to know. Uh, we have a higher and a lower calorific value. Uh, I'm sure you know the difference. Uh, the standard uh, burning process is the use of the lower calorific value. Uh, this means uh, that we have the vapor content, uh, which uh, comes from the combustion, uh, is uh, like a vapor in the flue gas chain. And if we want to use the higher calorific value, uh, we can uh, condense uh, this vapor in the flue gas chain and use also uh, this uh, latent heat uh, from the uh, vaporization. Uh, so this is the difference uh, we are used uh, to know the, the condensing boilers uh, from gas boilers. Uh, we can use this effect also in uh, biomass uh, district heatings and a lot of uh, biomass district heatings uh, are investing uh, in uh, condensing uh, systems now uh, because uh, they have a pressure to raise the efficiency. This means uh, if we use uh, wet biomass, uh, wet biomass means uh, in this range 35 to, to 50%, and there are quite a lot of uh, larger biomass uh, systems which uh, use uh, fresh biomass in, in this case. So they have the possibility to condense the flue gas. I want to explain it uh, in, uh, hope in a, a short way. Uh, in this diagram, uh, this is a diagram with the return flow temperature of the uh, heating system of the district heating grid and uh, you have the efficiency on the other hand side uh, and uh, this curve uh, these are really very typical curves uh, depending on the, the wetness, wetness of the biomass uh, which you feed to your boiler so there are two uh, I want to explain you two uh, possibilities with a moisture content of 50%. If you have a moisture content of uh, 50%, it's, it's more or less this line. And uh, you see the effect if you have a uh, backflow temperature of about uh, 60 degrees, uh, you get a, a bad uh, efficiency uh, in your burning uh, process because you have a lot of uh, a lot of steam, uh, a lot of vapor in the flue gas chain. Uh, how can we use the condensing effect? Uh, we have to reach the dew point. A dew point means uh, that the vapor is condensing and depending on the temperature, uh, uh, you have a significant rise uh, in the efficiency. But uh, to, uh, to get this effect, you need significant lower temperatures. And that's the point. And that's, 
this is the point where the, why it is very important uh, to get uh, low backflow temperatures. Uh, if you want to use heat recovery systems, uh, it has a small effect uh, at around uh, 50 to 55, but uh, you get a higher effect uh, if you get uh, lower temperatures. How is it uh, working from the technical point? Uh, you have your flue gas chain uh, from the boiler uh, with the hot uh, flue gas, and you have uh, two uh, main heat exchangers in such a uh, con condensing system. This means the first one is an economizer. Economizer means uh, you get out uh, more heat uh, to your water system uh, and uh, you drop down the flue gas uh, temperature to this point. And the next step is, the, is a, a condenser. In this condenser, you need uh, the lowest uh, temperature from the grid systems, in the uh, optimum case around 40 degrees, 40, 45, uh, and you can condense uh, the flue gas in this way. And then you get uh, low temperature in the flue gas and you get out uh, the uh, latent heat in this step. And this means direct saving of uh, biomass. And then uh, if you want, you can also preheat the air for the combustion. Uh, it is also a possibility uh, to preheat the combustion air for rising the efficiency of the boiler. Uh, there are quite a lot of systems in operation in uh, biomass, biomass heating systems uh, right now uh, for rising the efficiency. Uh, just to give you an overall example, how does an installation look like? Uh, you know already the boiler system is the heat exchanger uh, with a cyclone for getting out the fly ash. Uh, we have the high, the high temperature flue gas stream, and then we have the condensing uh, system, and then we have a, a, a quite low losses uh, through the chimney at a low temperature. Okay, and coming uh, to the end in the next minutes, uh, now we talked uh, about the general system. Uh, one uh, addition uh, to an efficient heating system can be a heat storage. And uh, during the last 10, 15 years, uh, we get also a lot of experience in uh, the uh, in the combination of biomass heating systems uh, with uh, large storage systems. So, what is the advantage of such a storage? Uh, it's a decoupling of grid uh, system and uh, heat production. So, in the grid system. Uh, we have a uh, load characteristic uh, if uh, the suppliers deliver uh, the heat transfer station for the customer. For example, uh, most of them have has a configuration for the hot water preparation at the same time. Uh, then we drop down the temperature during the night in buildings and they start heating uh, at more or less the same time in the morning, five, six o'clock in the morning. And for example, uh, this will uh, rise a, a peak in the morning. And uh, this peak has to be, uh, th this heat demand has to be produced from the biomass boiler. So the biomass boiler uh, has to go to maximum load or high load uh, in the morning just for one, two hours, and then getting back to a, a lower temperature. For example, uh, such a possibility is uh, in a decoupling uh, with a heat storage system. So you get a, a very much smoother operation and efficient, more efficient operation of, of the biomass boiler. So you can cover uh, these peak loads in a lot of cases. Uh, we have the problem that for the morning peak, uh, 
if you have enlargement of the grid systems, uh, the biomass boiler is on the limit. Uh, so you can also use such a boiler uh, for getting a higher load uh, in the grid system with a smaller boiler. Uh, so you get uh, high full load hours for your boiler. Uh, which is good and you cover uh, the peak load uh, from the storage system. The other possibility is the integration of industrial waste heat or the integration of uh, renewable heat sources. Industrial waste heat sometimes uh, it's not a base load like uh, if you have a, a heat from a biogas system for example you get a, a base load that at more or less a, a constant load. Industrial waste heat uh, can have very huge uh, fluctuations, so it's also good to have a, such a boiler system. And the other is uh, to save uh, biomass and to save uh, additional uh, fuels for peak load operation. I had a project uh, some months ago, uh, a large biomass heating system, uh, also a uh, biogas system where they buy the, the heat from the biomass CHP as a baseload operation. And in summertime, uh, if you calculate the balance on a daily basis, uh, the biogas system could deliver 100% of the heat for the uh, grid system. The real case was uh, that during the night, the heat demand was low. Uh, in the grid system and the morning peak uh, was uh, provided by the, by the uh, peak load boiler. This means an oil boiler. Uh, in this case, uh, they uh, invest in a boiler now just to store the, uh, the energy from the biogas system during the night and use this for the operation of the uh, for covering the peak load in the morning, just for one example. For the integration of uh, heat storages from QM Heizwerke, you see you can find a uh, hydraulic uh, solution, uh, how they should be integrated. I think this is a very good uh, tool where you see the, the biomass boiler. Uh, with uh, the pump and the regulation systems, you see the, the boiler with different temperature uh, levels, and this is in a parallel way. And you see also the grid pumps and the, the grid system. Uh, you get quite a lot of useful information how to integrate uh, such a boiler in a way uh, uh, that it works really efficient. And this is also an experience uh, we know from QM Heizwerke that we have established quite a lot of uh, storage systems, but not every storage system is working in an efficient way. Uh, this is uh, one uh, example of a, a system which is working uh, quite well. Uh, where I see more or less uh, constant uh, maximum temperature at 90 uh, degree, which comes from the biomass boiler. Uh, you see also the, the lower temperature, which is at around 52 degree. This uh, is a result of the uh, return flow temperature of the grid system. And between, you see the curves uh, of different uh, temperatures uh, in the boiler. And you see if the temperatures are all more or less uh, at the highest point, in uh, this case, the boiler is full. You see also the storage tank state of charge. Uh, this means in this point, it's, it's the boiler is totally full. Uh, the, the maximum temperature goes uh, until the bottom. And uh, if there is a peak demand uh, in the grid system, for example, you see it in such cases, uh, the temperature uh, from the, in the lower parts, uh, they're moving down. Uh, this is a case where 
where the grid is taking out uh, the energy from the storage and uh, you see the state of charge is, is more or less zero, it's, it's empty. And uh, then you see uh, that the boiler starts and uh, fill, the, fill the boiler, uh, fill, the, fill the storage system. So uh, you can analyze this with such diagrams. This is another uh, example which we can find also. Uh, we see uh, the power flow or supply temperature between 80 and 95, which is a too much uh, variation. Uh, the target value is uh, almost uh, 95 uh, degree. And you see the yellow line is the load of the boiler. Uh, the boiler is starting to uh, operation, uh, reaches the temperature, and uh, then if the boiler is full, uh, the, uh, if the storage system is full, uh, the boiler uh, stops uh, operation and the temperature is going down. Uh, so uh, this is not a case we want to have. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's a question of, uh, of setting the right parameters in the boiler. Uh, we can optimize this uh, maybe for an average like uh, this. Uh, the boiler should be operated at the lower uh, load level and for efficient operation. Josef, we have yes. two minutes left now until the break. This is the last slide. Okay. Break. Perfect. Uh, the overall efficiency. Uh, this is the last uh, figure and key performance indicator. Uh, to determine uh, the degree of uh, utilization of a system, uh, of the heating system, uh, we have in Austria, we have a flat rate model. Uh, and we say a biomass boiler has an efficiency of 85% uh, per definition uh, in uh, the system regarding to the regulation of the subsidies we have. And if we get uh, heat gains from solar thermal systems or from waste heat or other renewable sources, uh, we can increase uh, this degree of utilization. And uh, we have for new projects, uh, we have also a target value uh, of 75% uh, of the overall utilization rate. And overall utilization rate means the heat uh, provider and the grid system. This means uh, we multiply the 85%, multiply the efficiency of the grid systems, and it should be higher than uh 75 percent which means with a standard uh, boiler uh, we need uh, uh, heat losses of the grid systems uh, lower than uh, 12 percent otherwise uh, we have to have to raise uh, the efficiency in the systems and this is one reason why uh, we invest uh, now in heat recovery systems for example for getting better efficiency. So I hope uh, I could give you an overview. I was talking a little bit longer than planned, but I hope uh, there have been some interesting aspects for you for the optimization of biomass heating systems. Thank you.